Okay, now we're going to get to the controversy over Tillet. Um, I was watching, a, you know, ex interview after interview with the people discussing whether this is kosher, whether it's not kosher. Um, and there was a, one thing that particularly stood out to me is the idea that you see a person and you know what side they're on if they're wearing toilet. And so it separates one group from another. And I guess um, it's, it's, a, it's a very controversial issue in the Orthodox community. And I assume there are rabbis who are for, rabbis who are against. And then I heard one rabbi who said, if you believe the scientific process and you think it's right, then you can wear it. So tell uh, me about so, this yeah. raging controversy in Israel or in the Orthodox community, I assume all around the world. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting, uh, it's very interesting because, you know, um, Orthodox Jews and the more Orthodox you are, the more traditional you are. Orthodox Judaism in general is based on, on, uh, uh, to a large extent on tradition. Um, Orthodox Jews today are not biblical Jews, right? They're Jews who follow the oral tradition. And that oral tradition, you know, uh, has its own, uh, not only its own, you know, codes, but its own methodology. And um, every community separates itself by their, by, by its traditions, its traditions of dress and its traditions of, of uh, how they perform the different commandments and what they learn and how they speak. And, you know, and these things are, 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 uh, if you break down religion, I mean, there's obviously the spiritual part of it, and uh, but there's also very, very much the sociological side of it. Like all humans, we all identify, uh, we self-identify and we identify with the groups that we're part of. And and we follow those norms and codes and, 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 and most, and even dress. I mean, if you really look at yourself and you think about what it is that you wear and what you don't wear, you really kind of fit into what everybody who you hang out with is also doing, you know, to a certain extent. And with Orthodox Jews, that's very, 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 very true. You can tell, you know, the Hasidim of one sect by another, you know, to another sect by the uh, by the black uh, kippah that they wear, right? Does it have a ribbon around it? Is it felt? Is it silk? <laughs> right? Yeah. And and and. It would is be, it crocheted? Is it? Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. And 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 is it black at all? And uh, I mean, so the, to to an outsider, these things are, are are so trivial. What what is the difference, right? But to an insider, it really it, it helps them identify. And and so, all of a sudden, you're coming now, and you're you're not talking about just changing dress. You're talking about changing the ritual prayer shawl that they wear when they're, when they're, you know, in their holiest moments in synagogue and in prayer. And you're saying, you know, like to these, to us, to all of us, you know, what your father and grandfather did, well, you're going to do something different now. I mean, that's a, a very, very, very uh, a difficult position for many, many Orthodox Jews to take, rabbis and lay, and, and, and lay people alike. So you're really touching on a very, very difficult sore, sore point. Um, and so it's no surprise that you're going to meet with a tremendous amount of uh, inertia and opposition, uh, especially when um, you're maybe from outside the core group and not necessarily a rabbi or a leader in their community or really in any community. So, um, so all of that made what we were trying to do an incredibly uphill battle, almost almost an impossible battle, really. But the only thing that can trump uh, tradition is truth. And if, as we do believe, these really are those ancient snails, which thousands of years ago Jews used to make this trevet. And that was a fulfillment of the biblical command to put trevet on your then slowly but surely people who hear the arguments are going to come around to the arguments and you'll get one in one community and he'll start to pester his rabbi and say, well, you know, you're telling me that I shouldn't do this, but I, 
I, you know, it seems so logical to me and I have this source and that source and, and, and then you get another person and then the rabbi will, you know, come around and say, listen, really, I don't have any objection to it, but don't show anybody. So just keep it under your, under, under your shirt and don't show anybody that you're doing it. And, but, but that's the dynamic. And the dynamic now is 30, 35 years old. And I would say that Trevor has infiltrated it. I hope that I'm not using infiltrated as a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. Infiltrated every single community of Jews, Orthodox, non-Orthodox, Reform, Reconstructionist. There are people wearing Trevor in every single community across the globe. Not a lot, but they are here and there. And, and, and again, the search for authenticity and truth. And after all, you're talking about religious people who really want to do God's God's word. They really, they really do at their at their heart want 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 to do what they believe is right and what what you know what they believe the commandment tells them to do. So you do have, you know, people who are who are moving to, you know, to accept this, in, including rabbis, including rabbis of the highest, highest level. I mean again, I don't want to put any kind of a, you know, who's who or you know, great rabbis, but of rabbis who have strong following, rabbis of of, of ultra orthodox communities, rabbis of of uh, Hezder Yeshivot, rabbis you know in America and 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 in Israel and all over the world. So um, we never expected this to be anything other than a very very slow process. And quite frankly, uh, it's it's more encouraging than we even believed you know it could be. We're growing. You know, I, I would say by, you know, 20, 25 percent each and every year, which is fantastic, fantastic, great. And we think we think that that is, you know, reflects the demand, everything that we produce, we sell. So, uh, so far, I think uh, that's where it's going. But I'm not going to deny that you have you have skepticism and skepticism based on two things. The first is like I said, you just have this uh, the social component, and once once you know what you want, you can always find reasons. So if you believe that you don't want to change, then you can you know you can find arguments from the Talmud or you know or, or some of the commentaries or this or that rabbi over the last thousand or two thousand years or some mystic, whatever it is, you can always find arguments that you know will tell you or would point to the fact that it's. Not a good thing to, to, to try to wear this new trailer. But again, I think that many, much of the time, and I'm not going to com completely tell, tell you that everybody is being intellectually dishonest, but a lot of the time it's a, it's a mark that has been, you know, pre, pre sought, you know, pre, they, they, they know what they, what they're looking for. We know we don't want to change. We don't, we know that, we, you know, that we don't want to wear trailer. Now let's figure out why. That's often the case. Then there's also a skepticism based on science. You know, I can talk to you about archaeology and uh, HPLCs and chemical analysis and, uh, and uh, you know, linguistics. But that's not traditionally the way uh, religious halachic Jewish law is decided, right? So what about the books in the, you know, on the bookshelves, in the, in the Beit Midrash, in the, in the study hall of Torah. What do they have to say about it? And Tchelet hasn't been around for 1,300, 1,400 years, so they're not going to say much about it. And you have something here which is usually contradicted by something there. So there you have it. We don't know. If you don't know, yeah. better not to change. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that all this controversy is being caused by a string, uh, basically. Yeah. Uh, all this controversy is a microcosm to a certain extent of... Uh, well, I, 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 I won't go that far, but I will say something. You know, many of the people who are involved, again, Rabbi Tefker, myself, were religious. All, all of us were religious Jews, so we're we're not coming and trying to say, you know, let's do something new. We're actually coming and trying to say, let's do something that you everybody used to do. This was what those great rabbis in times of the Second Temple, Hillel the Great and, and uh, Rabbi Yehuda the, 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 the Prince and you know, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi and Rabbi Akiva and all the great rabbis, of, uh, you know, who, who are, you know, the, the, the ones who, who guide every step of the 
of the tradition, they all wore tchelet. <laughs> and they all wore tchelet. I'm absolutely convinced. They all wore tchelet that came from this little snail. So all we're really trying to do is saying, well, let's just be more authentic and let's just be, you know, let's go back to the way things used to be. We're not trying to say, you know, let's, I don't know, what are the giant controversies to have an organ in the, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the temple, which was the big controversy between Orthodox and Reform at one point, or, or you know, I don't know, what, whatever it is. We're not trying to change, we're trying, I'm changing, but we're, so, and yet, and yet, and yet, uh, there are many communities who feel that any kind of change is, uh, and how long does it take your um, your factory to go from snail to string? Uh, well, we don't do it that way. It's not, you know, like a serial process. A lot of things oh, okay. in parallel. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're always collecting snails. We're always processing them. We're always dyeing strings and 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 uh, and, and, and twisting it into the tzitzit. And we're always tying them onto the talib because there are quite a number of ways to uh, tie trelet that are not um, that are not in white if you're not proficient at it, which most people are not. So that uh, could be confusing. So it's hard, it's, again, it's hard to say that, but, I, but any particular snail is going to find himself on a talib probably maybe, you know, five to six months later. It's a process. It is right. It's a process, I and mean, like everything, especially if you're trying to do it efficiently, then you're doing a lot of things at the same time. Anything else you want to say to sum this up? Um, I would, I would maybe say one, you know, one little idea that we have, and that I think about a lot when uh, when thinking about Tchelet. So there's a uh, a beautiful little, almost a poem, I guess you would call it. It dates back to the second century, a Tana, great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir said, uh, why is Tchelet so special? And his answer is because Tchelet reminds you of the sea. And the sea reminds you of the sky. And the sky reminds you of God's holy throne. So that's such a beautiful little thought, uh, associative process. Because, I mean, of course, the first thing that you think about is, of course, blue, and blue, the sky is blue, and the sea is blue, and so that's where, that's the immediate uh, understanding of, of his little uh, poem there. But I think it's a little bit deeper than that. Maybe one of the ideas that's relevant, especially today, is if you think about it, the sea is a beautiful deep color, especially if you've ever been to the Mediterranean. It's just, well, you're, you have the Pacific Ocean. Yes. So I can't. Uh, uh, I've can't been to the Mediterranean. Words. Yes. But our little pond here is yes. uh, something that we uh, certainly consider the uh, the most beautiful. And the Mediterranean, or any sea for that matter, is just the most beautiful, beautiful blue. On the other hand, if you take a cup of water, it's transparent. It's clear. And the sky uh, you know, now as we're getting into our Mediterranean summer, then you'll go for six months without a cloud in the sky. And it's just the deepest, most beautiful blue, as Kandinsky, I think, is the one who said, the deeper the blue, the more it calls you to infinity. Mm -hmm. And it's really true, because you could just get lost in a beautiful blue sky. On the other hand, the sky in your hand is nothing. It's just clear. It's empty. So if you have something which is beautiful on the one hand and nothing on the other hand, like the sea in the sky, so what does that say about God's holy throne? And I think that there's a message there because the message is, I don't know what God is and I certainly don't know what his holy throne is, but I'm imagining that it's kind of the mediator between us and God. It's something that sits between us and the spiritual and it's something that connects us to the spiritual. And those things that are the most, the most, uh, the most potentially uh, transformative, those things which can bring us to places, whether it's art or music, or literature, or or anything that that rouses this beautiful spirit within us. On the one hand, can be beautiful, precious, meaningful, or on the other hand can be completely transparent and ignored 
And you can, you know, if you walk by the most beautiful piece of art, but, you know, like most of us are just all the time on our phones and we don't even notice it. Yeah. Right. So you have, um, you have this ability, unfortunately, more now, I think, than ever before in history to just be unaware of all of that stupendous beauty that surrounds us. And those things which we ignore and are transparent to us, if we just change a little bit of our priorities, focus and perspective, maybe we would be able to see how beautiful they are, right? Mm. A baby, a baby's face, right? Yes. What could be more beautiful that we have to pay, pay attention. We have to give it time. We have to, we have to, you know, be present and meditate on it. And so I think that that's one of the messages to talk about when you go to Tchelet and in the morning, when I take my strings off of my talit, when I when I look at them when I'm praying, and there's a part of the prayer service which talks about affixing a thread of Tchelet to the tzitzit, and it says the word tzitzit three times, and each time I kiss my Tchelet and I look at it. And I wonder, well, what's my day going to be like? Is it going to be a day of beauty, of, of meaning, meaningfulness, of, of mindfulness? Or is it going to be a day when, you know, I wake up, I go to bed tonight, and I can't even remember anything significant that happened during the day because I, didn't, I just didn't pay attention. <clears throat> it's a good message, I think, to, to keep in mind. Yes. And it's wonderful to learn about this dye, this fabric that is imbued with so much meaning and importance over the centuries, or over the millennia, actually. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, Baruch, for joining pleasure. me. I really appreciate this. And uh, I hope to visit your factory yes. when I come to Israel. <laughs> Everyone and all of your viewers are welcome. We are. Uh, we, there's a lot more to the story. And, oh, uh, well then. <laughs> There's a wonderful book on the topic. It's called The Rarest Blue, which was written yes. by myself and my, and my wife. Uh, we, we, we wrote the book together. And it's, uh, there's, there's quite, quite, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting story. Right? A, lot, a lot of different. Yes, uh, it sounded of, like an adventure, actually. It, yeah, reading it, 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 yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I hope uh, we'll take a look at it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure.